Hey, welcome back to the channel, everybody. This is Kevin. And in this week's video, we're gonna take a look at a sample video from our SEAL Core Video Training Series. Specifically, we're gonna be tackling securing a collaboration environment. For example, we probably wanna have secure communication between a Cisco IP phone and a Cisco Unified Communications Manager, and there are many moving parts that allow that to happen. That's what we're gonna be discussing in this video. We'll discuss this phone's manufacturer installed a certificate. We'll contrast that with a locally significant certificate. We'll see how a communications manager can have a self-signed certificate. We'll dig into the cap of the certificate authority proxy function feature on communications manager and lots more. And if you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, click the like button down below. It really helps the channel and subscribe so you don't miss any of our weekly content. Now let's take a look at the theory of securing our collaboration network. In this video, we're going to be talking about how to better secure our communications manager network. And when I talk about securing a network, I'm talking about two primary things, authentication and encryption. Authentication is about trust. We want our Cisco IP phones to trust their Cisco Unified Communications Manager server. After all, we don't want somebody to insert a rogue server on the network and have our phones registering with that server. And the trust relationship needs to go both ways. Our communication manager server needs to trust the IP phone. And authentication by itself, while it's great, it doesn't actually protect the data as it's flowing over the wire. If somebody were able to tap into that, maybe using a switch with a span port, for example, they might be able to capture this traffic and then play it back. That's sort of a modern day version of wiretapping. To help protect against a scenario like that, we can also encrypt our traffic. Encryption is going to scramble up data so that if somebody does intercept it, they're not going to be able to make any sense out of it because it's all scrambled up and they don't have the key that's needed to unlock that encryption. And we're going to be encrypting both our signaling traffic and our media traffic. And by media, I'm talking about voice media as well as video media. The signaling is going to be protected using a TLS transport layer security. We're going to see how that works in this video. And we'll also talk about how we can secure our media with SRTP. That's a secure version of the real-time transport protocol. And some of this, not all of it, but some of this is made possible because our unified communications manager network can use a PKI, a public key infrastructure. And to better understand how that works in our communications manager environment, let's consider a more common approach. Let's think about going out to Amazon.com and buying a book. Well, the PKI, the public key infrastructure, is built on certificates. Specifically, in our example, Amazon.com has a digital certificate. It's an X.509 version 3 digital certificate. And Amazon.com has a couple of keys that it's going to use for asymmetric encryption. Now, with symmetric encryption, also known as a pre-shared key, if you and I want to have a private conversation, we've got the same key so I can scramble up the data with that key, send it to you. You've got that key so you can unscramble it. And if anybody intercepts it, they're not going to be able to unscramble it because they don't have that key that you and I share. And while that's great, a challenge we have is how do we get that key in the first place that we agree on? Well, what we do when we go out to buy something from Amazon.com as an example we're going to use asymmetric encryption briefly until we can switch over to symmetric encryption. Here's what I mean. We said that Amazon.com has two keys, a public key and a private key. And here's the way those two keys work. If I encrypt something with my public key, it can only be decrypted with my private key. And I don't give that to anybody. And the corollary of that is true as well. If I encrypt something with my private key, it can only be decrypted with my public key. So what we do is we have our public key that we give to the public and we put that inside of our digital certificate. Now let's walk through this example and see how we can have a secure transaction between our computer and amazon.com. Let's say that we wanna buy something on Amazon. We've got something in our shopping cart we're gonna be checking out. You might notice up in your browser that there's a padlock or different browsers have different icons, but there's gonna be something to indicate that you have a secure connection. Here's how that happens. We tell Amazon.com, hey, let's set up a secure connection. And Amazon.com will give us a copy of their certificate. And this certificate needs to be validated by us 
After all, we don't want somebody to send us a phony certificate and say, yeah, I'm Amazon.com, here's my public key. How do we know this is really from Amazon.com? Well, sitting in the middle, we have a trusted third party, a CA, a certificate authority. And there are several companies out there that can act as that trusted third party, the CA. The first one that comes to mind is VeriSign. And built into our web browser, we have the digital certificates for lots of these different CAs. For example, here is a digital certificate from VeriSign. And in this digital certificate, notice we've got their public key. Now, how did I get this? It was part of my browser installation. And because I've got their public key, that means I can decrypt something that VeriSign has encrypted with their private key. That's the way that asymmetric encryption works. And this certificate that Amazon sent us has been signed by VeriSign, we'll say. And when I say it's been signed by this trusted CA, I mean it's been encrypted by them. So if they're using VeriSign, the CA would have encrypted Amazon's certificate with VeriSign's private key, which can only be decrypted with their public key, which I have. It's built into my browser. You see it on screen right there. So if this certificate really is from Amazon, then I'm going to be able to unlock it, if you will, using the public key from VeriSign. And once I've authenticated that, yep, this is indeed uh, the certificate for Amazon, then my computer on the left, it's going to generate a random number. That's going to be the key that we'll use during this session. In fact, it's called a session key. And I'm going to send that session key over to Amazon.com, and that's the key that we're going to use for symmetric encryption. That's how we get a copy of the same key, and nobody else does. The question is, I've got this big random number that created this session key. How do I get it to Amazon securely? Well, I've got Amazon's public key. It was in their digital certificate they gave me. And if I encrypt something with their public key, it can only be decrypted with their private key, which they don't give to anybody. So if I encrypt my session key that my computer made up, I encrypt it with Amazon's public key and I send it back to Amazon, if anybody were to intercept that, they would not be able to see what the session key was, even if they had Amazon's public key. Because remember, if I encrypt something with Amazon's public key, it can only be decrypted with their private key. And somebody snooping in and capturing those packets, they would not have Amazon's private key. But Amazon does. And when Amazon gets it, they're going to be able to decrypt that string. And now we have the same session key and we can switch over to symmetric encryption for the duration of the session, which is a lot faster, by the way, than asymmetric encryption. Now, let's take what we've learned about PKI and apply it to our Unified Communications Manager network. First, let's talk about some different supported security modes. For clusters, we have a couple of security modes. One mode is non-secure. We're not doing authentication. We're not doing encryption. The other mode is mixed. With a mixed mode, we can go to our endpoints, our devices, and we can say, yes, you're going to be doing authentication, or you're going to be doing authentication and encryption, or maybe you're not going to be doing either one. We might have some devices that do not support security. So we don't want to lock those devices out. So notice there is no secure mode for our cluster. There's only non-secure and mixed. Mixed meaning that devices that want to do security, they can do security. Our communications manager cluster is going to have a digital certificate, and we can play in this PKI environment. So if we want to do security, authentication, and possibly encryption on top of that, we want to be in mixed mode. But then we go to the device and say, here's your security mode. And we've got three options. We can be in a non-secure mode where we're not doing authentication, we're not doing encryption, or we can be in the authenticated mode. Here, we're going to make sure we're talking to a trusted party at the other end. I'm going to trust the communications manager server as an example. But authenticated by itself does not scramble up the data. It doesn't do encryption. So the third option for a device is encrypted. And encrypted implies that we are doing authentication. And on top of that, we're scrambling up the data and we've got encrypted data. Now let's take a look at how things work in that non-secure server security mode. In a non-secure mode, the signaling, probably something like SIP or Skinny, 
that's going to be using TCP or UDP, SIP can use either one, to send signaling information back and forth between the IP phones and the communications manager server. Once the call is set up, the phones communicate directly between themselves using RTP, the real-time transport protocol. Remembering that RTP is a layer 4 protocol based on UDP. In other words, there's a UDP header in addition to an RTP header. We've got a couple of layer 4 protocols. And RTP, that's going to be carrying the media. And by media, we're talking about voice and or video. But this is a non-secure cluster mode. We're not doing any authentication. We're not doing any encryption. If we move to a mixed cluster mode, here's what happens. The signaling is now protected inside of a TLS connection. A TLS, that's transport layer security. And you might have heard of SSL, Secure Sockets Layer. Well, this is sort of the next generation of that. This is the successor to SSL. And it's going to work pretty much like our Amazon.com example did. The IP phone is going to request a secure connection with Communications Manager. Communications Manager is going to send a digital certificate. And the phone is going to generate that session key, just like we talked about with Amazon. And that's how we can have this secure connection over which we're going to send our signaling information. And then our media, it's going to be protected with Secure Real-Time Transport Protocol, or SRTP. This is going to give us authentication in addition to integrity, meaning that if there is a manipulation of the data, we'll be able to detect that. And it's also going to give us replay protection. So somebody's not going to be able to capture a bunch of packets and then play them back later and have them believed as legitimate packets. It's sort of like we're putting serial numbers on the packets. So if we play back something later out of order, it's not going to be trusted. And for the encryption by default, we're going to be using AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. And instead of these IP phones exchanging digital certificates, SRTP is going to use a derivation function. They're going to have a symmetric key, and that symmetric key can change during the phone call. The way that happens is there's going to be a master key that's used in the derivation function, and that master key is communicated from one phone to the other in the session description protocol or the SDP message that's sent during the call setup. And it's going to say, all right, here's our master key, and here's how often we're going to be doing the derivation calculation. In other words, here's how frequently we're going to be changing our key. So if somebody even had the master key, they still wouldn't be able to intercept and understand our data because they don't know how often we're running that derivation function and changing the key. So those are the protocols that are going to be used to protect our signaling and our media. But we talked about trusting one another for authentication. There are some different trust lists that I want you to know about. The two primary lists I want you to know about are the ITL and the CTL. First is the ITL. That's the initial trust list. And yes, I know some literature calls that the identity trust list. That's not correct. It really is the initial trust list. And we're going to be using an ITL whether we're in a non-secure mode or a mixed mode. It doesn't matter because this is going to allow that endpoint, like a Cisco IP phone, to initially trust the communications manager server with which it's registering. But again, we're going to have this even if we're in a non-secure mode. If we're instead in a mixed mode, we're going to be using a CTL in addition to the ITL. The CTL, that's a certificate trust list. Now, this list is going to be signed. It's going to be signed with the private key of our communications manager server. And it's a listing of devices in our cluster that our endpoints can trust. And we said in order to make a lot of this happen, we need some digital certificates. The communication manager server needs a digital certificate. Our IP phones need digital certificates. So how does that work? Well, let's talk about the different certificate options. First, the communications manager server can have a digital certificate that is signed by an external trusted third party, an external certificate authority. Or we've got the option of doing self-signing, where we're not really talking to an external third party. We're signing the certificate ourselves. And there used to be a requirement that when you did a self-signed certificate, you had to have these USB tokens from Cisco. And you would insert this USB token into the USB port on your communications manager server. And it would have this private key that the server was going to be using. And by the way, if you were to enter an incorrect password 10 times in a row, 
you could never use that key again. That's the way it worked when I first started doing security with Communications Manager. I think that was back in version 4.0 is when that started of Communications Manager. But as of 10.0 and later, there's now an option to do tokenless self-signed certificates. With the tokenless approach, the private key of the Communications Manager Publisher, that's used to sign the CTL, the Certificate Trust List, rather than requiring a USB security token. And that's how our Communications Manager server gets its digital certificate. What about the IP phones? Well, one option is to have a manufacturer-installed certificate, or an MIC. This is a digital certificate that Cisco, for example, would include as part of the phone and it's going to be signed by Cisco. And Cisco is going to be our trusted third party. And our communications manager out of the box, it can recognize, just like my browser could know that Amazon certificate was signed by VeriSign, our communications manager server can recognize that this digital certificate of the phone was signed by Cisco. And typically, the manufacturer installed certificate is valid for 10 years. However, if we have a phone that is older and does not have an MIC, or if it's been longer than 10 years, or if we just want to create our own certificate, we can have those phones use an LSC, a locally significant certificate. And this is going to be signed using a service running in Communications Manager that's called CAPF, and that stands for the Certificate Authority Proxy Function. That's going to be running on our Communications Manager publisher, and only our publisher, and it can sign this locally significant certificate that we generate for the IP phone. Or we do have the option of having that phone's digital certificate signed by an external certificate authority. But usually with a locally significant certificate, we let the CAPA function take care of that. If you have both an MIC and an LSE, you've got the option of saying which one you prefer to use. And that's an overview of how we can better secure our communications manager network by protecting our signaling using transport layer security, protecting our media using secure RTP, and we saw how these devices can trust one another with the ITL and the CTL lists, and we talked about the role that certificates play in a PKI infrastructure, and how both our communications manager servers as well as our endpoints can obtain those digital certificates. 